Thank you for your patience, and I apologize for the te technical difficulties we've experienced thus far this evening. My name is Kyle Jensen. I'm the Director of Writing Programs uh, at ASU, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the fourth and final installment of the 2022-2023 Tomorrow Talks. The Tomorrow Talks event started with a simple premise that we wanted to connect our students to the most brilliant, most inspirational, the most world-changing thought leaders of today so that we could change the world for tomorrow. And tonight we're excited to welcome an absolutely inspirational writer, Jamel Hill. Jamel is the award, Emmy award-winning former co-host of ESPN Sports Center and the 2018 NABJ Journalist of the Year. She is a contributing writer for The Atlantic, where she covers the intersection of sports, race, politics, and culture. She is also the producer of a Disney ESPN documentary with Colin Kaepernick. He'll grew up in Detroit, graduated from Michigan State University, and now lives in Los Angeles. Today, Jamel Hill will be talking with my colleague, Aviva Dove Vivon, who is an assistant professor of film and media studies here at ASU and a contributing editor for the Scholar Writing Program at Ms. Magazine. She is a co-editor of a collection of essays forthcoming this spring with Lever Press on public feminisms from ac academy to community, and is currently finishing a book project for Rutgers University Press titled, There She Goes Again, Gender, Knowledge, and Power in Contemporary Film and Television Franchises. Please join me in welcoming Jamel Hill and Aviva Dove Vipon. Thank you so much, Kyle and Jamel. Thank you so much for being here. Um, sorry again to everyone um, watching and listening for our technical difficulties. Um, I'm glad we were, we managed to <laughs> sort of all come together. Um, Jamel, how are you? I'm I'm well, and um, yeah, thank you everybody for hanging in there. Yes, um, I I loved reading your memoir, um, and your, it takes us through your upbringing in Detroit, your experiences at Michigan State, um, and defining moments of your career so far. But I, I wanted to start with a phrase you use early on in the memoir that just really stuck with me as I was reading the rest of the book. Um, so you write, this is a quote, as a little girl, I knew I wasn't ordinary. I knew I wanted to live the life my mother, father and grandmother would have chosen for themselves if their paths had not been altered by their personal demons and other circumstances that were often beyond their control. And then you offer this concept of generational liberty as a kind of alternative um, to the more commonly sort of known idea of generational wealth. So what is generational liberty to you? Well, to me, it is that freedom of choice. It is uh, the ability to move about freely in the world um, without your existence being questioned at every moment. Uh, I know for marginalized communities, people of color, Black women, women of color, that this is, while we may enjoy the identity that we have and we find pride in it, um, there are limitations sometimes understood or sometimes ones that... Um, you know, one that just kind of are a result of other, you know, climates that we have to deal with in society. And I think especially for families who have experienced generational trauma the way that mine has, is that uh, the freedom of opportunity, choice, liberty comes in many different forms. You know, the freedom to not just survive, but to live, which is something I definitely hit on in this book, uh, because I think that's important. Um, I think so much for Black people in this country, our existence, our being is entirely um, attuned to survival, but it's not exactly in tune to living. So I wanted to be... Um, of a generation in my family that actually got an opportunity to live and not just to survive. One, well, it, it feels like your memoir is kind of embodying that as well, right? Because you talk quite a bit about the fraught relationship that you had with your mother um, as a child. And um, some of the things that were going on with your mom were not things that you really had a full grasp on, right? Um, when you were a child. Um, but as you were writing, you had to sort of learn more about some of those stories um, and you write about your family with um, sort of tremendous compassion and thoughtfulness. And so could you talk a little bit about the process of going back in some ways to your childhood through your writing and, and how that made you think about those experiences perhaps differently? It did. It had been a while since I revisited many of the things that I wrote about. Um, 
you know, some could say by design, but also because I, I sort of had dealt with a lot of those issues already, or at least certainly was living under that assumption. And going back to revisit them, I now have the perspective of being a 40 plus year old woman <laughs> who's lived some life and uh, who has had some experiences and understands now more than ever that your parents, the people in your life who were there to guide you, they are not perfect people. There are people in many ways that had to deal with a lot of circumstances, issues, um, you know, personal demons that you really didn't quite understand in the moment because the role of a child in many ways is to be selfish. Like you're centered on you and how everything impacts you and what you can't do because of somebody else. So everything is very you focused. And then when you become an adult, you understand a little bit more how the world works and that your parents were just really doing the best they could. That's not to absolve them. That's not to say that uh, there's no accountability that needs to be able to be there. But it is to say that I think the more you experience life and live life, that you understand um, how to give those people grace and how to um, see them as whole people and not just as your parents who always have to be doing the right thing or always should be making the right decision, you see them a whole lot differently. So going back to revisit some of it uh, was very eye-opening for me. There were some details I had frankly forgotten uh, that my mother reminded me of. There were um, other instances and stories I frankly never knew. Um, and I had to learn and, and hearing it wasn't easy because uh, some of it was some pretty harrowing stuff that I just I just didn't know that my mother had not shared with me. So it was a much different kind of conversation than the conversations that my mother and I had over the years uh, about her addiction, about um, the way I grew up, the way she raised me. And so it was very, I, I believe that it was very, um, you know, sort of, it was very cathartic for our relationship. I think it allowed it to breathe in some ways that it hadn't been able to breathe before. Well, it, it seems like from reading your memoir that, um, you know, you use the word cathartic and it seems, it seems like that relationship has sort of improved a lot, right. As, as you're an adult as well, it gives you a different kind of perspective, of course. Um, so you write about your time also, um, as an undergrad at Michigan state and, and how that was really formative for you. You were first able to really sort of step out and be on your own, um, and sort of think of yourself as an individual sort of apart from your family. But you also write, I thought this whole sort of section was really compelling um, that you had this sort of jarring realization when you got to Michigan State, which is a predominantly white institution um, that many white people go years, maybe their entire lives without really thinking about race um, or really thinking about sort of the, their relationship to black people or black people at all or people of other races. Um, so. How did you navigate that realization and how does that, how did it or does it inform your sort of choices and relationships? Yeah, in Michigan State, growing up in Detroit, I got a different sort of racial education because Detroit is 85, 90% Black, um, all, you know, from uh, kindergarten through, from elementary school to middle school to high school, the majority of the student body was Black. So I was always used to coming from a majority perspective. I looked around. Nothing but people that nothing, uh, nobody around me but people who look like me. Everywhere you went, you know, uh, from local government on down, that's the way Detroit was. And so to go from that to the exact opposite, to go to uh, a much smaller environment, because when I was growing up in Detroit, Detroit had a million people, so I was used to being in a big city. So to go from there to East Lansing, Michigan, uh, a student body of about forty five thousand. Black students maybe make up three to four percent of the student body. Like I knew Michigan State was a predominantly white institution, but I was like, man, it is white, white, like <laughs> much whiter than I thought it was. And what I learned very quickly through interactions with my sweet mates was that most of the white people that came to Michigan State, or a good deal of them, um, and not just with my sweet mates, but classmates and just being in on campus, they just the majority of white students just had no close interaction with people, um, uh, people of color. I mean, and really black people, that's what we're talking about. And people have to understand that Detroit is very segregated. Yeah. The city and the suburbs, the reason why Eminem called it eight mile is because eight mile div divides the city from the suburbs in the city of Detroit. And I was, when I was growing up, we were taught don't cross eight mile because that's what the white people are. And over there, 
you know, you have to worry about um, experiencing racism, police, like other things you did not have to worry about when you're on my side of Eight Mile. And the surrounding suburbs of Detroit are very much like that. So my sweet mates, as I write about in the book, they're from a city called Sterling Heights. When I was growing up, we used to call it Sterling Whites because it was nothing but white people there, right? And to talk to them, it was really very eye-opening because they had never heard. I think we may have a slight lag. You're back. <laughs> I'm back. Uh, that was very odd. I don't, I'm not really sure what happened, but. Uh, it's to the finish, night for it. It's all right. Yeah, I guess it is. Uh, to finish my answer, you know, as I said, my sweet mates, they had not heard of Malcolm X or Martin Luther King. They had a very limited scope and that's, they were <laughs> part of the reason why I make that joke now about you know, all this national hysteria over this fake issue of critical race theory. It's like, trust me, some of the white people I ran into in Michigan State, y'all had to worry about them learning about black people. It didn't happen. <laughs> it's like, you're fine. <laughs> it's all good. But but it did drive home the lesson that there were that there was such a bubble that a lot of white people lived in where they did not have to have any interaction with anybody of color ever if they didn't want to or very limited. Um, and it was very evident in some of the conversations that I had and certainly a lot of conversations I had inside the newsroom of my college newspaper. And, you know, we're all young journalists trying to figure out how to get better at our craft, get better writers, understand how to co cover a community. But you have somebody who had never gone to school with anybody Black their entire school career. And while to some degree you could look at my history and say, oh, okay, but you weren't exposed to that many white people. And that was true. But I did know, you know, I, I knew who uh, George Washington was. Like I knew who Benjamin Franklin was. Like all the markers of, if you want to say predominantly white history, I knew all of that. And it was not reciprocal. And so what I quickly found out was that not only was it something that wasn't necessary to their life, it was also something they were never curious about. And that was very fascinating to learn. Well, yeah, I mean, I think this idea that because, of course, you were exposed, right, because in school, popular culture, everything, right? This is where you're going to be encountering all of the same things that they are. And then they're, you know, sort of blocked off from um, other parts of sort of your world, right? Um, since you, you mentioned journalism, and I want to switch gears a little bit to talk about um, your, your career. Um, I love in the memoir, you talk about that the best story that you ever wrote, um, your sort of favorite story is not what people typically expect, right? So that it's not about the many famous athletes and celebrities that you've spoken with and written about in your in your career so far, but it's this piece on Mandy Garcia, right, who is a cross-country runner, first woman to attend the Citadel under an athletic scholarship. Um, why does that remain your favorite story? I, I think be, uh, thinking about the time that it was, uh, you know, I was fresh out of college, uh, really trying to find out and figure out who I was as, as a writer. It was a story that was connected to a national issue in the sense of, uh, you know, I was, I think I might've been in high school when Shannon Faulkner tried to gain entrance into the Citadel, the first woman uh, who did that. And it did not go well. And it was a huge national firestorm. I don't think Shannon Faulkner, Faulkner lasted that long at the Citadel. And so the issue had kind of quieted down. And here you have the Citadel now has advanced to the point where they have the first, their first female athlete. And uh, for her to be a cross country runner, cross country, it was kind of the perfect symbol of what she was trying to do. Because to be really good at cross country, yes, you have to run, and uh, but it's about endurance and stamina. It's not really about speed. It's about how long you last. And so <laughs> that was very much um, very appropriate, considering that is what her experience at the Citadel was going to be like. You know, other women had not lasted there. I think they did have maybe a few female graduates, mm -hmm. but. Generally, it, it was still under the perception it was not a very welcoming place for for uh, women. And I just thought Mandy, Mandy was about the work and she didn't want to be a symbol. She did not want to be somebody who was carrying the burden of representation. She wanted to go there, you know, get her degree, um, earn the respect of others. And she had a very much a military mindset. And it was just very inspiring to watch. Now, she was from Fayetteville, North Carolina, which is a military town. So she had family that was in the military, so I wasn't surprised at that. But um, access is always important. So I was able to kind of go through this process step by step with her. 
And then, of course, I think there's something to be said about covering people and things that are not covered very often in the media. Um, and, you know, uh, I also think it shows the power of sport. Um, there is probably a lot of people who may have been against women being at the Citadel at all. And maybe they read the story and it changed their mind because of the type of person that Mandy was and what she was trying to accomplish. It would have been very difficult not to be inspired by it. So I love that story, not just because of the person I got a chance to write about, but also because, again, it shows the power of sports. It's, it, the great thing about sports and, and why I chose that as opposed to being a news reporter or features in entertainment or something else or politics is because sports has this ability to bring people together. Um, it's one of the few things that we do together as a society. We all watch sports. Um, you can have a, a group of Laker fans that can come from different uh, economic backgrounds, different races, different regions, all got one thing in common. They all love the Lakers. They all love to watch LeBron. And if you have that connective tissue and that commonality, people would be surprised at the number of conversations you're able to have with sports being used as a gateway. Well, that serves as a really perfect segue because I want to talk about ESPN, right? So a lot of people I'm sure on this webinar have seen you on ESPN and um, you were a celebrated sports journalist before that, of course. Um, and and I like in the in the memoir how you say that you never wanted to be on television. Um, and then not only do you end up on television, but you end up at ESPN, which is um, <laughs> the sort of top sports network. <laughs> um, so so before we get to specifically to ESPN, I just can we talk a little bit about that transition to. Um, from like, this is not for me, TV is not for me, um, to em embracing this role on um, ESPN as a, as a TV journalist, and then eventually ending up on SportsCenter, which is sort of one of its most iconic shows too. Uh, for journalism students today, this is probably going to sound completely crazy, but there was, through much of my professional career, um, at least through early on, I would say at least the tip first 10 or 12 years, the idea of print people being on TV was not a thing. I mean, it, it certainly, you would see it here and there and you had shows like the sports reporters. And then by the time I got to be a columnist at ESPN, um, or I'm sorry, at the Orlando Sentinel, the first time I was a columnist, uh, my first job rather as a columnist, uh, I think around the horn was starting. So you saw like more TV personalities and you had, you had um, you know, also part in the interruption. So it, it was happening, but it was not a thing. It's like most print journalists did not want to be on TV. We considered ourselves to be the real journalists and the TV people were not the real journalists. And so the idea of crossing it over to crossing over to the dark side was like, who would do that? And once I got to ESPN, because I came there as a writer, they did not hire me as a television personality. They hired me to be a general assignment sports columnist for ESPN.com. And once I started doing TV, um, well, one, I didn't even know I got paid for it. Like, I just thought it was just part of my job responsibility and that was it. And then I did um, a show called Cold Pizza, and which eventually became First Take that you see it now. But originally, it started off as like sort of a morning variety show that was not centered on debate. Debate was part of it, but it was just a very small part of the show. And I did that show for a week. All I had to do was a couple segments of arguing with a guy named Skip Bayless, who obviously is still on TV now with um, at Fox with Undisputed. I might have, for the whole week, done about 35 minutes of TV. And when I got a check in the mail that was like for $3,600, I could not believe it. I was like, wait, I get paid and this much money? Why are you paying this much money? <laughs> and then sort of a light bulb went off like, you know, as, as good as a writer as I think I am, and as much as I love writing, it'll always be my first love. There's sort of a cap on what they'll pay a writer, generally speaking. There's not a cap on what they'll pay you for being on TV. And within my first couple of years at ESPN, I saw Matt Lauer sign this gigantic deal at NBC where he was getting paid $25 million a year. And I'm like, that's possible in television. <laughs> And, you know, just really not just from a financial sense standpoint, but looking at what made you valuable at ESPN, um, it was television because television was the straw that stirred the drink at ESPN. And if I wanted to have a longer future there, then mm -hmm. I had to get into television. And so it was economic slash market factors that made me embrace 
doing television and I like to do it. You know, it was fun to do. I didn't take myself too seriously, which I think worked very well for me early on. I always felt like I could be myself um, and you could make a lot of money. So to me, it sounded like a win all around. <laughs> well, and it gives you a different kind of reach, right? You're then yeah. reaching, which can have its, you know, pluses and minuses. Um, just as a, this isn't a question, but just as a, a, a quick, uh, comment um you talk in the memoir about some of the skits and other sort of fun things that you did and I love the different world opening <laughs> yeah. Center, it's my favorite. One, that was one of my favorite shows as a teenager. well yeah and I mean and that's you know that was another part I enjoyed about it is you know especially the type of television that me and my former co-host Michael Smith did is that we didn't really believe in rules and a lot of times we were doing our stuff on tv we probably had no business doing and for some reason they let us do it and there'll never be another sports op- a sports center opening like that ever. I'm pretty confident in that. I mean, for us to be able to recreate the theme song, to get all of the original cast back with the exception of, unfortunately, Jasmine Guy and Kadeem Hardison, because they were actually filming something together. And oh, they wow. were, yeah, they were filming something together and they were very upset that they couldn't be a part of it. But we got Sinbad and Daryl Bell and, everybody else was in and um, we involved our ESPN colleagues and it was really um, it, that was one of those days and one of those experiences where I, I was just so excited and happy to be in the position I was to make something like that happen. Yeah, I know it's, it's so great being able to do that. And um, I, I wanted to just um, sort of reflect a little on the sort of flip side of that though, because you talk about how um you know, they, they wanted you and Michael Smith for Sports Center because you would sort of be bringing a different um, kind of spin to the show. And yet that also caused some tension, right? So you talk about how um, at, there became a certain point where it, it felt like some of the higher ups at ESPN were felt like Sports Center was getting too black, right? Um, and and I, I always think this is this is a sort of constant problem this desire for innovation um that but then also the sort of that rubs up against the sort of desire for wanting things to be that stay the way they are Mm -hmm. um so how do you deal with those kinds of contradictions like you're asked to go on sports center to make it fresh and new and then get pushback right it it's kind of like gentrification in this way uh you know, you have these cool neighborhoods that people who are really from a certain area that they put their sweat equity into, they make it cool, they make it vibrant, they uh, make it culturally relevant, the culture's all around. The same thing that attracts the people is the first thing that they want to get rid of once people start coming from other places to be in those neighborhoods. So that is kind of what we experience, is that the thing that attracted them to putting us on Sports Center is the conversations that we had about, you know, race and and gender and just about sports period, not always heavy issues. It was the skits. It was the pop culture references. It was the fact that we were unapologetically ourselves on TV. That's what made them promote us to sports center. As soon as we got to sports center, the first thing they tried to drive out are all the things that attracted them to put us on sports in the first place. It wasn't like that initially, um, but a significant uh, thing happened during our time there. I mean, we took over Sports Center in 2017, February of 2017. Mm-hmm. So we are just a few months, you know, sort of into the the Trump presidency. There's a different feel around ESPN because ESPN has been put in the middle of a culture world. It has never happened to this network before, but you started to hear a lot of banging from right-wing media and right-wing pundits who saw ESPN as low-hanging fruit because they felt like ESPN was too liberal and too political. This coincides with the fact that the faces of ESPN are changing in the sense of, well, it, you know, a lot of people grew up at a time where it was Chris Berman and, and Stuart Scott and Keith Oberman and Dan Patrick. Those are the faces of the network. But then what happened, the faces of the network became me and Mike and Bomani Jones and Sarah Spain and Stephen A. Smith and Dan Levitard much different faces, much blacker faces. You have more women who are in position where they're giving um, their commentary, driving shows with their opinion, not just teeing up other men to get their opinions. So, so much about ESPN was changing. And a lot of people didn't like that. So suddenly when the faces change, the narrative that ESPN is too political, 
too liberal starts to come. And so they're over this shadow. And when we took over Sports Center, a lot of the early commentary about our show was very reflective of this polarization that ESPN was in. And I think the network, as sometimes corporations tend to do, they started reacting to the reaction instead of trying to pave the way so that we can do the best show possible. And we had a regime change maybe six, seven months into our show. The person who took over our show, I'm pretty confident, would never, ever have wanted Mike and I to be the Sports Center host. He wanted a traditional Sports Center. We never wanted to do a traditional. Looks like we have another lag. I'm just going to wait a minute for it to fix itself. Single day. It was already happening. And that was a big reason why I chose to leave Sports Center. Um, it was my decision to leave. Uh, contractually, I was obligated to do the 6 p.m. Sports Center, but because of you know all the other stuff going on, of course, with the, the whole Trump controversy, I found myself in the middle of. Uh, I, I think they understood that that was the best decision, not just for me, but for them too. And you know, I, I know that everybody wouldn't have made that decision. Some people would have just said, you know what, I got. Three and a half years left on this deal. I'll suck it up. I'll do sports center every day. I'll do it like they want me to do. It's not how I roll. And especially since sports center wasn't on my dream board to begin with, I guess that made it an easier dream to leave because I didn't dream about being a sports center anchor. I understood the position I was in. I understood that it's a legacy brand. It's the baby of the company that a lot of people wait their entire careers to anchor sports center. But if anchoring Sports Center means that I don't get to be me and I have to be the version of me they want me to be, I'm good. <laughs> I can walk away. I can well, and, easily I mean, you walk brought away. Up, sorry. No, no, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> you, you brought up the sort of the Trump tweet controversy, right, in fall of 2017, uh, which threw you, I mean, you were already more in the spotlight than you'd ever been before on Sports Center, but threw you even more into the sort of public eye um, uh, and into the sort of crosshairs of Trump and his um, his followers. Um, but I mean, I think, you know, there were a lot of people during that that felt like as a sports journalist, you shouldn't be talking about politics. Um, so, but, and I, I, I agree with you, right? So that you should be talking about politics. Sports has a lot to do with politics, but can you talk just a little bit about as we sort of, more, and then we're going to, we're in a minute, we're going to wrap up and I'm going to have some students ask some questions, but I wanted to um, just ask if you could talk about why sports and politics are not mutually exclusive, especially when it comes to issues of race, actually. Okay. I think that, yeah, I lost you for a brief second. Yeah, yeah I'm back. Okay. Um, no, I, I think we've, we've conveniently fooled ourselves into thinking, that the world is happening here and sports is happening here They're in the same world. So the same problems that exist in the world exist in sports. I know we have sort of allowed ourselves to fantasize about sports always being about meritocracy, it always being about fairness. And yes, it is partially a meritocracy. But at the same time, during this time, um, where I made those comments about Trump, you have a president who the professional athletes largely don't want to deal with. You know, you you have teams that see going to the White House as a political act. They don't want to be involved. You have, um, you know, some of the biggest stars in sports criticize the president. Like it created, uh, you know, you have the president coming after Ka Colin Kaepernick. You have him in inserting himself into the NFL. So you could not have separated them if you, if you tried. And then there's this idea that has been the case in, in journalism. And you have to wonder, was this ever realistic? You know, my, I heard my whole career that you have to be objective, objective, objective. And I don't think that we should have been told that. I think what we should have been told is to be unbiased perhaps, but objective is a little different. Our job is to seek the truth. Sometimes the truth actually has a side. And what winds up is that when you hide behind objectivity is that you wind up platforming two things and making it seem like they're the same. And sometimes they're not. So when I made those uh, tweets about Trump, this was maybe a few weeks after Charlottesville. And mm -hmm. we saw that the former president equated counter protesters with neo-Nazis. And the media all just seemed to go with that narrative. I was like, those two are not the same. All right. And so that's what I mean, where objectivity can have you looking foolish in history. 
And, you know, with that having happened and to me with the president picking the side of white supremacy, then the other thing is, well, yeah, I'm a journalist and yes, I'm a sports center anchor. Though at that time, I, 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 me and Mike used to, we used to call ourselves former journalists because we weren't going into locker rooms anymore. We weren't writing stories anymore. We weren't doing the function of journalism. We were commentating and yes, we were bringing you the news, but much more on the entertainment side of things than I think on the journalism side. But then there's this idea that the people who bring you the news or talk about it, that we have no um, agency of citizenship. I pay taxes just like everybody else, okay? And so at some point, the identity of what I do is not who I am. <laughs> and so when I did those tweets, I was not on company time. I was, you know, uh, at home and going back and forth with a Twitter user. And so I think what was the surprising part and why the story exploded the way that it did is because you you did not expect this to be coming from a sports center anchor at ESPN of all places. So it was the who, the where, and the what that all combined to make this kind of a, a much bigger deal. But yeah, throughout my entire career, you know, they don't want uh, a lot of places I work. They didn't want journalists uh, that work for the paper. You couldn't have political signs on your yard. You know, some journalists even took it so far as to not vote. And I'm like, you crazy. Cause <laughs> like you you pay taxes, you should vote. I was like, I mean, I, I get that you want to make people believe that you're trying to report fairly and accurately on the news, but my God, you are a citizen. Like you do have rights as a citizen. And so, um, so yeah, I don't know if it, if that expectation that uh, of, of neutrality was ever something that we should have been making the core of our profession anyway. Truth, accuracy, fairness, much more important than sometimes the um, very uh, soft shield of objectivity. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the the sort of lesson you impart in your memoir, you talk in other places too about objectivity being not just, should not just be the only goal, right? Um, I want to turn to the student questions, um, but I did want to say, I meant to say this earlier that I just heard that your podcast Jamel Hill is Unbothered was nominated for another NWACP Image Award. So congratulations. Keep Thank you. Appreciate back. it. Yeah, yeah. We, we won, we um, won two yes. last year. And so uh, definitely hoping um, to win again in the, uh, I think it's Outstanding Arts and Entertainment Podcast mm -hmm. category. Yeah, I'm, I will be excited to sort of follow up on that and see how that goes. Um, all right. So we're going to let a couple students ask questions. The first question is going to come from JP. Hello. I'm Hello. JP. Hi. Hey, JP. Hi. I am a rhetoric major, and my question for you pertains to the chapter, Are You There, God? It's me, Jamel. And I know <laughs> that it's inspired by a Judy Bloom novel it that is. is actually banned in many schools for discussing puberty and sexuality. Would you talk about why referencing this title was important? like an important framework for explaining your own childhood, especially as you discuss the importance of identifying Black female role models and becoming a writer? Uh, thank you. That's, that's such a great question. And um, boy, uh, they win the Bad Timing Award because now it's going to be a movie. So to your book band, ha, <laughs> right? Um, so that that book, like a lot of Judy Bloom books, books was uh, very influential on me as a writer. I, I love the way Judy Bloom wrote, um, the language she used, the emotion she was able to bring to the pages, the way she made her characters come alive, obviously. And me being a, you know, teenager as you're grappling with all these different emotions, I could identify so much with Margaret, particularly as it related to her spiritual struggle. And trying to figure out, especially because I grew up in a household that was, um, you know, Christian, um, with an asterisk, sort of, you know, my grandmother was was a heavy, you know, a heavy member of a Baptist church. So she grew up Baptist. Her family grew up Baptist. So that was running through the bloodlines of my own family. And as what happens in a lot of cases with, you know, kids is that the parents and the grandparents and everybody, they sort of try to force you into, you know, I don't mean to make it sound bad, but, you know, if your mom's a Christian, she's probably going to try to make you be one, too. I mean, that's just kind of the way it goes. And yet there was, 
you know, a lot of questions that I had, but I didn't feel the agency to ask them, even though I wondered about all these things. And so reading how Margaret had her conversations with God through her diary, um, it really spoke to me. And uh, as I write about in my book, uh, writing in general was a refuge, but having journals, having a diary was an even stronger safe haven for me because of all the things that were going on in my childhood. And so when I hear about that book being banned and knowing how just impactful it was for me to be able to have a character in a book that I could relate to, even though on the surface of it, we have nothing in common. She's in New York. She's Jewish. <laughs> you know, we have age in common and we have emotion in common and relatable circumstances circumstances in common, um, you know, to deprive kids of that, I think it's pretty sad. Um, and unfortunately, uh, what has been the case for a while now is that there's a lot of loud minorities running this country right now and setting the tone for, um, you know, things that they shouldn't really be involved in at all. And so to think that there's a generation of young people who will not be exposed to Judy Bloom is, um, it's really heartbreaking. And I just hope this is a fight that we just don't let happen. You know, I've said this to people many times as, uh, you know, not just, are you there, goddess me, Margaret, Toni Morrison, several of her books are being banned across the country. You look at the situation that's happening in Florida and it's obscene. And, I, you know, we have this attitude of like, oh, you know, it'll only get so far, very passive. And I was like, no, no, it's gotten pretty far. And so I'm like, what is it gonna take for us to understand how critical it is that, uh, you know, we show up whether you have kids there or not, just as people who feel like exposure is important, you know, because the thing about books is books make you curious about the world. You know, there's a reason why uh, when you study the history of the Nazi regime, why they went after the books, because the books are the ones that inspire the critical thinking. They get you to ask questions. They perhaps teach you how to be humane to other people, especially now since we've had so many um Black authors and queer authors and Latino authors who have given us a picture of identities and people that we don't normally interact with and how to have empathy and understanding and cultural competency with these groups. That is what they're trying to fight against. And so that's why we need to take the book banning very seriously. And I know you can access it in Barnes and Noble and I get it when people hear about stuff being banned, they're going to probably seek it out anyway. But that's not the point. The point is, if you think it's going to stop at the schools, you're lying to yourself because they will come for the public libraries next. And then what? So like, there's always an elevation to go. So I'm really, really passionate about this fight, especially as an author and especially as somebody who knows what an impact books made on my life. I agree with you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, our next question is from Hayden. Hayden, are you there? I am. Hello. My name is Hayden. Hey, hey, um, hey I know what's up? I know what, I'm good. I know I look about 14, but I actually am an instructor here um, <laughs> in English composition. Um, thank you so much for being here, Jamel. Um, I'm so excited to be able to brief, briefly share this space with you. Um, I loved your book and I responded to so much of it. Um, and one of the things that I responded to the most was the invocation of music. Um, mm -hmm that appeared a few times. There was uh, your auntie's daughter, I believe, who had, you know, was born with that magic voice, that golden mm -hmm. voice. Um, mm -hmm. The tapes you played on long car rides. And um, <laughs> I think at one point you mentioned B's halftime show with Destiny's Child, although I might have. I think I, yeah, I, th I, think, I, I think I may have referenced did. that, yeah. <laughs> um, and so my question to you is, um, if there was a a secret chapter, I think 19 it would be, of this book somewhere, uh, <laughs> maybe, you know, for the paperback edition or something, um, that was about music and the way that music has impacted you. Um, I would love to know, you know, what what might be in there. Was music a balm for you during those, those early, really difficult moments? And maybe um, who are some of the musicians that might have been most impactful to you in your life so far? Well, thank you, Hayden. I love music questions. So, I mean, like a lot of people, you know, the soundtrack of your life. And so for me, uh, especially growing up, you know, I, I like hip hop was born essentially during, you know, kind of th that impressionable time where I was just like really getting into music. So I still remember the first time I heard my Adidas by Run DMC and still remember, you know, because it was a, a kid that lived on my grandmother's block who had the, the cassette tape and we wore that sucker out. 
Uh, and the beauty of like being in the Midwest is that you are equally influenced by both coasts. So I, I listen to NWA and Ice Cube and, um, but also EPMD and, you know, all the New York rappers, like everybody, you know, in the Midwest kind of gets down, you know, to both. So I think I wound up with a pretty wide palette. And then you have the influence and, you, you know, these kids today, they don't know about that struggle of, you know, riding around with your parents and you have to listen to their music. You don't get to control the radio. There was no iPods. So you had to listen to it. And so because of that, that also gave me a deep appreciation for music in the 70s and the 80s and especially 70s and 80s R&B. Because when I'm riding with my mother, I better not touch her radio, okay? I had to listen. I was so thankful when the Walkman got invented. And even then, I had one of those mothers, I couldn't just listen to it all the time or whatever. Like, Because, you know, they just felt like during those times that anything you listened to or played all the time was somehow going to ruin you. I, like, that was what it was. So it's like, if you listen to music too long, like, do something, read a book. And it's like, oh, oh, okay, I'm just listening to music. So, um, so in terms of R&B, like Stevie Wonder, who I think, is not often enough in conversations for greatest musician of all time. You know, I think songs of the key of life is the most perfect album I've probably ever listened to. And so that was like a big core piece, you know, and of course living in Detroit, you know, of course you have the Motown stuff and just Detroit legends, Anita Baker, Aretha Franklin, like huge, huge parts of, of me developing um, the love of music that I I have. And, you know, I still enjoy hip hop, but I think like probably a lot of people my age are prone to the hip hop from your era, you know, Jay-Z, Nas, Biggie, Pac, like the usual suspects. I do like some of the current rappers for sure. Um, but, you know, I mean, I kind of, I hold music in the regard of, of it takes you back to a time and, and place. You know, probably my favorite female R&B artist of all time is probably Mary J. Blige. Every album, I can tell you exactly where I was emotionally, mentally, Every time her, her album dropped, What's the 411 came out in high school. And because I was a tomboy, I was so excited to see her wearing a baseball cap and a baseball jersey. Like she had that whole tomboy vibe going. I was like, yo, that's my vibe. I see you, Mary. And then when I got to college and started, um, you know, having complicated love situations, my life pulled me through. <laughs> then it was sure my world that pulled me through. So it's like every album, I could tell you exactly what I was going through. And so I appreciate that music does that. It's markers in time. It's your history that's being told through the music that you you listen to. And as you can tell, based off my answer, answer I'm 2,000 years old. So that is, <laughs> you know... Thank you so much. That's such a cool lens to be able to see you through. Thank you. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Um, we have one more student on who's going to ask a question. Aaron. Hi there. Hey, what's um, up, Aaron? Nothing much. Just listening to your talk. Um, I'm actually a communications major. I just had a quick question for you. I really enjoyed your book. Um, you spend a lot of time and uphill talking about learning to become and eventually becoming a professional writer. I was wondering if you could talk more about how you decided the structure of the book and what you hope audiences learn from the specific decisions you make as a story storyteller. Oh, great question. So um, before I wrote this memoir, I would not have described myself as somebody who is into memoirs. I was actually really into fiction. And one day I do hope to write a fiction um, book because that's the book I really wanted to write. Um, I had no plans to ever write about myself. And so with that being said, I was very curious about structure, storytelling. The number one thing you first think about when you write a memoir is what to leave in and what to leave out. And how does this tell a cohesive story about my life? Because every single incident you experience in your life doesn't necessarily fit into the story arc, the larger story you're trying to on the tell. And so you have to kind of play a process of elimination game. So I read a lot of memoirs. I started reading a lot of memoirs. And the ones that stuck out to me, and in particular, I purposely read memoirs of people I would not have naturally been interested in. Demi Moore's me uh, memoir was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Structurally, how she did her book helped me structure my book. It's not identical, but then I got it because she was able to really take pivotal moments and put them together in a way that was like, okay, that makes sense. So I was like, I got to think about the pivotal moments and I got to think about what story these pivotal moments are telling. 
Uh, her book was really good. Her memoir, um, Sally Fields, was really good as well. Um, Jennifer Lewis, I read hers, like, fantastic. And, um, you know, and then, uh, granted, her, I think hers came out before my memoir was done, but probably maybe the best one, I should say, listen to it. I make the distinction of listen to because uh, she's actually up for, uh, I believe she's up for a Grammy for it, was Viola Davis's. That, that's the best memoir I've ever listened to. Like, there's gold standard. I mean, g- good luck on anybody becoming close. Be- and that woman's story, I don't know how she's here. I really don't. But it's fantastic the way she structured her book as well. So uh, I got really good, some really good advice from two of the most unlikeliest people. One of them was rapper Rick Ross. And Rick Ross told me, he was working on his memoir at the same time I was working on mine. And he was a guest on my podcast. And we were just talking about the process and I was asking him questions. And he said that he boiled his life down to 16 moments. And he was able through that to, to kind of connect the dots about what made these moments special. What was the through line between all of these moments? And I was like, oh, that's such a good idea. Let me do the same thing. And I did that and it worked. The other bit of advice that I got was from Walter Mosley, one of the most prol- prolific writers. Um, you know, in history. Um, and granted, he writes fiction, but he writes so many books. I'm just like, how are you doing this? He told me to do something that I'd never done before as a writer, put myself on a schedule. And the thing about writing that I had to get out of to write this memoir is I couldn't write by feel. By that, I mean, like, I couldn't write just when I felt like writing. To finish, otherwise, you're never going to finish the book because there would be one week where I might easily write 70 pages another four weeks zero because I'm waiting to feel in the mood to write you can't always do that and what he told me was to put myself on a schedule every single day because he's on a schedule so every single day no matter where he is in the world he writes for at least two hours he doesn't care if it's crap he doesn't care like he at least writes because he said it's important that you get your ideas out. And even if they're bad, even if the sentences are bad, like nobody ever sees it, like who cares, you know? Like, but it's important that you get yourself, you train yourself to do this because writing is a discipline. And I never really looked at it that way. It was always because it came so naturally to me and being in journalism that you're used to writing with deadlines. I mean, if my book editor is like, oh, you know, it's like February. She's like, oh, if you can have, you know, the first 75 pages to me by like the end of summer. I'm like, what? (laughs) That does not compute because I'm used to being told like, hey, uh, this just happened. We need a column for you a day from now. Or when I was covering a beat, you cover a game at 7 p.m. That game story has to be filed by 1130 p.m. So you have four and a half hours to write. So you know what the assignment is. And I was so used to the adrenaline rush of procrastination <laughs> that I had to uh, put myself on a schedule and put myself on a schedule at a time where I could not be bothered. And so I did that as so I finished the book. And I'm the kind of writer who likes to, I need a little white noise. So I got into This Is Us. <laughs> not the best white noise, because I was like, man, this is, so this is depressing. But I got all into it. So I had like, a rotation of three shows I was watching, Grey's Anatomy, This Is Us, and um, uh, Young and the Restless. But I've been watching Young and the Restless since I was a teenager. And it's like perfect because it can be on, I don't have to pay a whole lot of attention to it. And I'll just look up and be like, Sharon lied about that being her baby again. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's just kind of fun to do. Like, what? He married his third wife for the fourth time? Who knew? And so... Um, so yeah, like I just needed that and that was off to the races, but definitely, uh, you know, you don't want to copy someone else's style necessarily, but all the memoirs I was able to read, um, as I was writing my book and even before I started really, really getting into the teeth of it, were just helpful just in terms of me figuring out the structure. And another friend of mine who had written a book, um, she told me, she said, you got to let go of your first draft being perfect or being in any kind of decent shape. It's just a starting point. She was like, so your first draft is going to be terrible. Like my first draft was 400 pages and probably a good 50% of it was terrible, at least in my eyes. And then after I got some notes from my book editor, 
um, that were really, really good, helped me structure it even more. And so I could feel the story getting closer. I could feel the gel form happening. And that got me really excited. So I enjoyed the editing process much more than I enjoyed the rough draft. <laughs> Thank you so much for giving me a glimpse into your process. That was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, everybody's is different. Like you'll, you know, what you'll find whatever yours is. Um, but I, I, I get so much more now. And my former uh, colleague, Michael Smith, used to say, because he, he could write, but I don't know if he loved writing. And he, as he used to often say, I like having written, meaning it's done. And people um, ask me, like, what's your favorite chapter in the book? The last one. That's my favorite chapter because <laughs> that meant it was finished. <laughs> um, so uh, sort of a wonderful answer. And now I, I love memoirs. So now you've given me a whole list of a list of memoirs to read. Viola Davis's was next on my list, actually. So Oh, please read this. I mean, yeah. it is like I, I, I cannot really talk enough about that memoir was one of those that just Ooh, that would change me. I got to say, like it was it was really, really dynamic. And yeah. um I'm just, I already was a fan of hers, but you know, it might be, I'm, it might get embarrassing if I run into Viola Davis out in these LA streets. <laughs> um, we're, we're running a little, a little late. Um, I had one more question from a, an, the audience. Would, would you be willing to take it? Sure. Yeah. Wrap up? Okay. Yeah. So this is, I'm going to ask it um, um, for him. This is from Tommy Moore. He's an online grad student in communications here. And he asks, what advice would you give to young professionals feeling the pressure to code switch in predominantly white workspaces? I'm well into my career, so it's not an issue, but how can those just starting off navigate social pressure, pressure to suppress their own culture for the sake of fitting in? Well, what I would say is this, um, there are levels to it. And, um, you know, early on when you're trying to figure out what your development track is, because that's really the number one thing is like, when you have those, like all the jobs or the job that I took, uh, my first job out of college, it was really all about the development. Um, it, you know, I, at that point, I'd had four internships in newspapers. I'd interned in Lima, Ohio, Detroit, Philadelphia, Cleveland. And um, I decided to go to the News and Observer in Raleigh because they actually hired their internship interns from internships. And so I thought I had a really good job of that being my first job. And, um, you know, it was, it was, it, it was different. And the one thing you're afforded as a sports writer, uh, in a way, this is a bit of an unfair question is that you don't have to spend as much time at the office as everybody else, because you're usually out covering a practice, a game, you know, you, you, you have to travel to the work. I mean, you could do something at your desk, but like, it's not generally things that you, you, you don't, a lot of sports writers never go into the office. And while I had to go in there more than I probably had any other job till I got to ESPN, you are able to get some, a little bit more distance from the newsroom politics. So I'm, I'm coming from the position of that, but I say all that, you know, to say this, because obviously once I got to ESPN, I'm in the office every day and, and have to deal with those same things that they're talking about. I think as you climb, you will get to be more and more of yourself. How you get to show up at work very much depends on the leverage and the support that you have it becomes more of a political game than anything. And that's tough because when you first start off, you don't have any leverage. You're building your support. And I'm not telling you to suppress yourself to the point where it feels uncomfortable or it eats away at your integrity. You should never do that because I think it's really important that wherever you go, know who you are before you go through the door. And you know, code switching, um, it depends on to what degree you're talking about or what I would consider to be code code switching is that if you're coming in there and you're turning into a whole new person, that is not the place for you. That's one, that's an extreme level to me. If you're coming in there and maybe some of the things you don't do at home, you don't do at work, that's fine. That's just called etiquette, right? That's not necessarily code switching. It's like, you know, yeah, like at home, I probably listen to some NWA at work. I'm probably not going to listen to some NWA. I mean, so it's a little bit different. So I think anything that imposes on your integrity, you have to ask yourself, is it worth me trying to go there? Uh, is it worth me trying to sacrifice this part of myself? 
Um, and some of it depends on like, what is your opinion of fighting the battle from inside or from out of it? I mean, the, the truth of it is that I think to break some of these structures that need to be broken, pressure has to be applied from inside and outside. It has to come from both directions. People on the outside can apply a different kind of pressure than people on the inside. And just to give like sort of a, a small example, you know, um, my podcast is exclusive to Spotify. Uh, so I have a business relationship with them, obviously. When, um, you know, we, we also have collaborated and I have uh, built a podcast network for Black women in Spotify called the Unbothered Network. And we launched our first two podcasts last November, The Black Girl Bravado and Sanctified. And we'll be adding some more podcasts over the course of the next couple of months that center Black women. That's the whole point. When the Joe Rogan thing happened, a lot of people were coming to me saying, what do you think about Joe Rogan and um, his, you know, saying racial slurs and this and that. And, you know, that's somebody that Spotify decided to invest a huge amount of money in. I don't know Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's business ain't got nothing to do with mine. Zero. And as I think about me wanting to do this podcast network for Black women, and people are like, oh, you know, how can you still work with them and this and that, is creating um, opportunities for Black women in podcasting is giving that up worth Joe Rogan? I say it is not. That's too high of a price. Uh, and if Joe Rogan and I were treated differently in the sense of I had Spotify executives calling me saying, hey, you need to tone this down, that'd be a different conversation. But that is not the conversation I've ever had with Spotify. And so what I can do from the inside is not only build this network, which will not only create opportunities for Black women in podcasting, but Black women producers, um, cause my whole team with the exception of my, uh, engineer is all black women that run social media, that the talent, the producing, the creative producing, the executive producing, head of content, all black women. So what I then, but that's the inside pressure that I can apply. And on top of that, um, Spotify, as a result of these controversies, they created an hundred million dollar equity fund that they were earmarking for black content creators. If I can't apply the pressure or ask how they're using that fund or make sure how they're using that fund in a way that they said that they were, okay, if I'm not there. So that's why I say that, you know, when you mention about um, code switching, um, I don't think you need to code switch. I think you can be exactly who you are with the intentionality that you have you may need to make some minor adjustments, but don't let those minor adjustments adjustments talk you out of the long game. Because if the long game is for you to gain a bit of leverage, political capital, support, allyship, that will put you in a position to make sure the next person that comes behind you doesn't have to code switch, then it's probably worth it. But that's something that you have to gauge and, and judge for yourself. I'll, I'll thank you on, on Tommy's behalf. <laughs> um, <laughs> so wonderful advice. It's been really fantastic to spend this hour with you, Jamel. And um, I, I hope that it's always so strange. I, can't, I don't know what the, what the audience is doing, but I hope that they, I'm sure that they've all really enjoyed it too. Um, for those watching, if you haven't read Jamel's memoir, it's wonderful and I really enjoyed it. And I'm a memoir connoisseur, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, but and I'm so excited to see sort of what you'll be doing next with your podcast and with the podcast network and your production company. Um, uh, was there anything else you wanted to sort of close out with before we? Yeah, I, I will, and, and um, that's to address uh, a um, a question that I think was put here in the chat because I, I do think this is very important mm -hmm. um, for especially for a lot of the. Uh, the people who might be listening to this who are um, aspiring sports journalists um, or, you know, just in, in sports business overall, there was a question asked about uh, whether or not I can, you know, add something to uh, uh, or whether or not addressing the idea of, of learning Black history as a part of these particular professions. So here's what I will say about that. Um, as a journalist, I'm not saying that you will do this perfectly. But you should be one of the most well-read people. And when you think about the role and the job of the journalist, it is to chronicle history. That's what you do. 
the way you chronicle history in present day, you have to understand what's already happened. See, when you asked me earlier in this conversation about sports and politics, I can answer that the way that I can, because I know that Jackie Robinson integrated Major League Baseball in 1947. He did that a full almost, what, 20 years before we got the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. And so when I tell people um, at a time where segregation is trying to be broken down in this country, they did it 20 years before it was. Sports was able to lead that conversation. And you have to, when you're talking about whether it's not sports and politics have mixed, you have to know the history of sports and where it has mixed in order to know that. And by that, that means you have to read something. And it's your job to bring this context to what we're seeing in, in present day. So I've read a ton of sports history. Like I'm looking at uh, one of my, I have bookshelves behind me. And if you can't tell, I'm trying to sell the books. I certainly have some books <laughs> that are up there that would, you know, fit this fit this mold. But I have a lot of, you know, history of books dealing with sports. You know, I'm looking at two Ralph Wiley books. And if you don't know who Ralph Wiley is, he was an incredible sports writer. He was the first black sports writer I saw on ESPN was Ralph Wiley. And fortunately, he's no longer living. But he wrote two great books, um, A Lifetime of Punches, Players, Punks, and Profits, um, where it has all his classic columns. Because he, I think he was the first black writer at Sports Illustrated. I think that was Ralph Wiley. Uh, he also wrote a book called What Black People Should Know Now should do now. And just on my shelf over here, I have a three volume book about black trailblazers that was written by, written by Dr. Richard Lapchick, who runs um, the sports and society um, uh, um, uh, program at university of central Florida is like, I think one of the only sports business schools that, that are in the country. One of the few, much like uh, you all have going there. I have a Spencer Haywood book. I have like a ton of stuff um, covering eras. I didn't live through because I need to know, what happened in order for me to understand what's happening today, what even happened to shape what even I knew to grow up. So you can never have too much historical knowledge. So I would implore all of you to learn about the history of sport. Learn it. If you're going to uh, talk about college football, then you need to know the history of college football. And I don't mean who won, what championship and when. Do you know how college football was integrated? Do you know what team was the first team to integrate in college football? It was my alma mater. That's how I know that. It was Michigan State. <laughs> so, and do you know why? Black players were even wound up at Alabama. It's because uh, I believe Alabama got their ass kicked by USC. I read a great book by Bill Roten. I highly suggest it. It's called $40 Million Slave. Um, and what you would not know, maybe by watching sports in present day, is that all the, the horse jockeys that you see, they used to be all black might want to find out what happened and why that isn't the case anymore. So these are all the things that you need to learn and bring to the table as you're writing about sports to understand current condition, to put things in the context and understand the legacy of racism in sports, to be frank. I mean, if you want to understand it in this country, sports was not exempt. And so you need to know what that history is beyond just the results and the outcomes. You need to know the stories, the structures, the issues, um, the voices, what they went through. Like a lot of people didn't know um, that Jackie Robinson, the end of his uh, life, he talked about how he would never, toward the end rather, how he would never stand for the national anthem again. So if you think it started with Colin Kaepernick, it did not. There was somebody else who is very revered in history who had the same thoughts about the flag. So, you know, when you are writing about this national anthem issue, you need to know that. So. That is my pitch and my plea to you to never stop educating yourself, never stop learning. Number one thing you need to have as a journalist is curiosity. And so you should be feeding that curiosity all the time. So when people want to say, oh, was this the first, this is the first time that's happened. Was it? Guarantee you look back, probably wasn't. <laughs> well, I think that's a, that's a sort of fantastic place to, um, to end here is this sort of invocation to curiosity and, um, finding the truth and finding stories right in, in our history and in our present. So um, thank you so much for speaking with us tonight, Jamel. Um, and I also want to thank um, Dean Jeffrey Cohen and English Chair Krista Radcliffe for their support for this program um, and Kristen LaRue and Bruce um, Matsunaga for their help organizing this event. And of course, additional thanks to Peter Jansen and Byron Echeverria from Macmillan Publishers. 
And we finally want to also thank our incredible ASU writing teachers who work tirelessly to help ASU students imagine a brighter future. Um, and, and also all of you who are here, um, who are here today listening um, and watching. And, and yes, again, a final thank you to you, Jamel. Thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. All right. Thank you. Enjoy. Take care, everybody.